round of applause for this woman. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Can, so, I, do, can I do a shout out? To yeah, all the, please. All the parents shout out the whoever house. you want. So shout out to all the parents who, who have babysitters and <laughs> made it work. Made it work to be here. Amen. So this is the first time I'm interviewing you, so I'm very excited. We've had conversations on the side, but right. I've read all the fancy magazine profiles, as I'm sure many people in this audience have. I've listened to the podcast, but I sort of want to hear in your own words, who is Arlen Hamilton? This is a, this is a Beaches moment. <laughs> Does anybody know nobody watches Beaches too, too old for you? Um, who is Arlen Hamilton? Well, I, I, I identify right now as, as the, the, the founder of Backstage Capital because it's so important to me. And it's, it's uh, s such a part of my DNA right now. And um, I'm, I guess I'm someone who, who constantly finds ways to um, build my own space in, in places where I don't see myself. So I want to talk about how you built your own space and how you got here, because it is certainly the atypical Silicon Valley story. I mean, you had no college degree, which isn't that atypical of Silicon Valley, but no network, no money. You were Correct. on food stamps? Correct. Like, you really were on food stamps. Oh, yeah. People are like, how homeless were you, and were you really on food stamps, or is that just a, t a good title? I, really on food stamps, and, and sometimes wasn't on food stamps, and that was the problem. Like, sometimes couldn't get food stamps. And you were investing in Texas, in tech. Yeah, I started off by, um, I started off by working with companies mm -hmm. out of Texas and uh, was, felt like I wasn't on an island, but I, hadn't, I had no money at that point. So how did you fall into this? Like, how did you find the I, tech industry? Uh, so I had kind of g gotten my way into working on music and, and music uh, production, uh, live music production. And I was seeing some of the people that I looked up to and also found entertaining were making investments in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And I knew as a customer, what Airbnb was. I knew as a customer what, what Warby Parker would have been, but I didn't realize that they're like the teams behind it. And so once I understood, okay, Ashton Kutcher is going to this magical land called Silicon Valley because he <laughs> wants to invest in this company, and that's why he has a sticker on his, on his uh, laptop. And I was like, wait a minute, that's, those guys are me. And at the time it was guys, you know, those guys are me. I'm just in a different package. I've always felt like this hacker uh, entrepreneur type, and I just uh, didn't know that this place existed. So once I understood that, I wanted to be part of it. And when I tried to be part of it, uh, there was not much there for me welcoming me. And that's when I started seeing, oh, wow, like there are a lot of us who are, who are like me and like people that I admire who have a lot to offer and are you know, in some cases, brilliant, um, but they just don't have that same access to the, these resources that these other guys do. And, 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 and I heard little stories like the Airbnb guys, which, who I, I really like, where they had like the cereal boxes that they would sell to make the money to keep them going. And people in Silicon Valley were just like, that's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard in my life. And I'm Obama like- Obama owes. For me, I thought it was brilliant, but I also thought that's a Tuesday for me. That's us <laughs> figuring it out, right? So I said, if that is powerful to this group of people who has a lot of money and resources, I can't imagine what they'll think when they see us coming. And so then, you bought a one-way ticket. To San Francisco. I crowd, crowdfunded a one-way ticket to, to San Francisco. I mean, I'm telling you. When I say broke, I mean broke. <laughs> and you slept on the floor. She slept on the floor of the airport. Yeah, I did that. Um, I, I, you know, some people say, oh, she couch surfed. I'm like, that sounds more fun than what I did. <laughs> you know, I was in my, in my mid-30s. and I hope and, you were in Terminal 2. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I was in, actually, I was there last night. I was like, I mean, not, not I left. <laughs> I, I was in front of the Frontiers line. Uh, Frontiers uh, kiosk, and I was there. I found myself there again because I, I was like, oh my god, am I back? You know, it was it was really trippy, but yeah, it wasn't um, it wasn't fun, and it wasn't glamorous. I'm sure it'll make a great Lifetime movie one day. So, so how did you actually get your first break? I mean, were you just emailing everyone you yeah, possibly could? Yeah, so I emailed could, a or? ton of people, and I got better and better at that. I started out really 
giving people my life story and, and not being con concise as I could. But I learned from it and I tried to learn from it and I learned everything I could on my own, which is what I really recommend to anyone here who's trying to start something. Just have so much information that you have. You own that. You own your information. And, and so that was really important to do. And so over time, I got my way there and, and I came here and I went to a course uh, that 500 Startups was putting on so I could at least like be around other people. I then just met everybody I could and for months people, they didn't know that I didn't have a place to live. They just knew I was trying to raise this fund that was kind of weird, that, was, that sounded more like a philanthropic uh, venture than anything. What was the thesis at that point? Like, the what was the pitch? The same, it was that I, um, I'm a gay black woman who has access to founders who look different than the status quo and who are doing amazing things at a discount. And if we, if they have done so much with so little, what happens when you give them more? And don't you want to be at the forefront of that because things will change in the next five years. This was 2013 on the next five years, things will change and people would pat me on the head or ignore me or and I remember distinctly going to conferences and getting my way in and people would just ignore me when I tried to talk to them about it and those some of those same people chase me down now chase me down to can I pick your brain can I have coffee with you and I'm like yeah you had a fund and you wouldn't listen to me before and now all of a sudden you do so I mean it it's important that you you kind of give people that dignity of, of at least taking them seriously so how did you get your first check the very first check was from Susan Kimberlin. She is an angel investor. And a, a woman. And a woman. I was going to say, I think it's important to point that out because I think it was going to be a woman that gave me the first check. It took a few months of education on my part to, to explain to her what I wanted to do and also just venture in general because that, ha that was a whole kind of, uh, barrier. And once she, once she got it, she was like, you know what? Why not? Let's try and let's see what you can do. I guess for her, the worst thing that could happen is that she lost that certain amount of money and it wouldn't go negative, right? So she gave me that, that first chance and that's all I had been waiting for for years. I had been working towards that moment, so I was ready. And as soon as she gave me that first um, check. $25,000. It was $25,000. It was the same size as most of the investments that I was making or would be a making. And as soon as she did that, it was more than anything else, uh, someone calls it uh, a confidence check. That's what it was for me. Because I was like, oh, it's on now. <laughs> it's on, you can't stop me now. It's on. I mean, you've, you since you got money from Mark Andreessen, Stuart Butterfield, Aaron Levy, and you have- I let them into the round. Yeah, you let them in. Um, how much money? <laughs> Have well, you invested now? So we've invested around five million dollars, um, and um, but you got a thirty-six million. Yeah, we're fund. we're we're pledging a thirty-six million dollar mm -hmm. fund into Black women, one million dollars at a time, and so um, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I, it's really important to understand that 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 first five, the first million, was twenty-five thousand dollars at a time, mm -hmm. where it took dozens of no's to get one yes at a time. It's really important to remember that I never want, I never want to forget that myself because uh, we've invested in 100 companies now. And to me, that's the important part. And there's billions of dollars being spent year. I think what, 2018 was 100 billion in venture. And we're talking about 5 million, 36 million. It's, it's the tip of the iceberg. There needs to be much, much, much more. Uh, I think I propose that you know, 10% of 10% uh, more of funding could go into underrepresented founders in any given year, and that would change everything. And you're taking this global. You are launching an accelerator program in London and LA. Yeah, LA, Detroit, Philadelphia. Detroit's here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Philadelphia and London, and it launches March. It's our, our team. I, I take very little credit for it because it's a team um, of of thirty people that are amazing, and and we're taking it to the cities that we really believe in. So, so what's the strategy? I mean, how do you choose which black female founder to invest in, or Just which in person of color? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, that's evolved over time. I'm doing the same thing that most investors do is figure out my thesis, figure out what's working, what's not. I mean, at the earliest stages, we're talking pre-seed and seed, anyone who tells you they have a real strategy is probably lying to you or themselves. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, there's no one who can predict, but what we So what is it? Is it like a gut feeling? Is it the yeah, people? Yeah, so for the first 60 or so investments, <laughs> it was gut. It was... Um, not letting go of the of sort of that naivete that I had, I thought that was really important because it was magical. Everybody else had the, sort of the same thoughts, and if I if I kind of walked into the room a little bit rough around the edges, then I thought, and I still think that that is my edge. And so it was seeing it's pattern matching for grit. It's seeing someone that reminds me of myself. And I, I haven't said this a long time, I'll, I'll bring it back out. Uh, it's being hungry and not thirsty. Mm. It's, be, it's someone who you, you know they'll do almost anything for their company, but they also can take constructive criticism. They also uh, can learn and, and, and teach. And, um, and you know, someone who's a domain expert or who has equivalent expertise, right? I'm not looking, I'm not looking for someone who, who necessarily looks great on paper because there's plenty of funds for that. Um, I get offered a lot of deals that are like, you know, mainstream, great returns, and this is sort of easy for you, but it doesn't fit our thesis. Mm. It's, uh, I'm looking for people who are going to, um, who are underestimated, and that's something really powerful in that. If, you're, if you have an entire portfolio of people who are underestimated every day of their lives, they have a lot to, to prove. Now, you're in like chapter one, right? Yeah. Or like the I prologue. I chapter two. Okay, yeah. chapter I'm in two. chapter two. So what do you say to the people who say, right how do we know if you're a good investor? The story remains to be yeah. written. Yeah, that's, and it's a very fair thing. I think I did a, a letter to my LPs uh, recently, our investors, and I said, you know, the novelty will wear, wear off really soon. I'm very aware of that. And now it's about showing and proving. And it's about returns. I think it's also about being very realistic and, and putting us on the same, like um, treating us the same you, as you would treat someone else. Because I have a lot of white male counterparts who do not get asked in, in year one, how are my returns? I, I, you know what I'm saying? I have a lot of them that don't get asked that question, but I get asked that question. Oh, have you had any exits? And I'm like, we invest in pre-seed a year, uh, half a year ago. No, we don't have exits right now. But I do, I do think, believe, and also know that um, this year in 2020, just based on our portfolio and the conversations I've had and the ways we've been able to help, I know that we will have exits. And that'll be really interesting for some people. And then there will be, you know, we are very, we're in it. We're in it for the long haul. We're not tourists. So we don't encourage our founders to do some sort of flip just to make us look good. That's not interesting to us. I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm gonna be here um, in seven years for you if you're a founder of ours. It's, it's just the way I feel about it. And so I think w how you start measuring us over the next two years and how we've been measuring so far internally is um, how, what kind of revenue is, is, is being generated at these companies? What kind of growth is happening? With, with, and, and compared to the right com com uh, comparison of how, many, how much resources how many resources you have. So what do you say to the criticism that you're helping some people who might not care as much as they should about diversity check a box? Oh, you mean like our investors are people who kind of take the picture with us? <laughs> so the, the investors are not people who take the picture. The vet, I turn away people who take the picture, right? And they're like, hey, will you come to our luncheon? And I'm looking at the list and I'm like, oh, you're gonna sit me right in the middle, aren't you? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> um, so. The, for some people, I think, who, so people who invest, you have to understand I have to be careful because um, I, I really don't mind what people think of me, but I do have an entire group of people that I'm speaking for sometimes, and I care about their well-being and their livelihood. Um, I, I believe that if you're, if you're an investor in us, um, you, you probably have invested for one of three reasons. Maybe you invested because you think it's the right thing to do. You like think it's like a heartwarming thing. Uh, another reason is like more on like the Mark Andreessen side is like, like he's so rich, he'll never, 
you know, th this is like one ski lift <laughs> <laughs> ticket for him. <laughs> it's like, oh, I lost a ski lift ticket. I can't do that. But I think he's just super curious about what I do. And I think that still drives him every day. I haven't talked to him about it, but I would imagine someone like that, it drives them to see what is this lady about? What's gonna happen there? And then <clears throat> there are people who just look at it and say, you're just right. Like, this is a no-brainer. I don't care about the warm and fuzzies. You're right. Like, no one's looking at these, this group of people. It stands the reason that a few of them are going to outshine the rest and they're going to uh, outperform. And let's, let's do the same thing we do with, with most things in the same boat. Um, so anyone who is, who I've sort of missed in my, in my radar or my filter, because uh, I'm usually good at it, but anyone I've missed who's just doing this being part of this um, to look good, uh, you know, they won't last long in our orbit. We, they won't last long because um, maybe they got through already, but you know, uh, real recognizes real. And that won't last long. And I, I'm telling you, there's many, many people, there are many, many people I have turned away and, and said no in the deepest, darkest times. So <clears throat> let's talk about that because okay. there's been a recent Twitter kerfuffle. Some Twitter, of you what is that? may have seen this. We could do a whole session on Arlen's tweets. I actually thought about <laughs> picking 10 tweets. Um, you've had a situation develop with Paul Graham that actually didn't start. You were brought into it by yeah. fans, actually. And I'm just curious what you think happened there from your perspective. Um, well, I mean, I guess the short, short version is that I was tagged, a woman named Lisa is awesome, she's interviewed me before in Albuquerque. Um, Paul just listed, Paul Graham you know, runs YC, and he listed, he said that some of the best investors that he knows are operators, which is a fair, some, you know, fair assessment. He said, all the best investors I know are more like founders than investors. Fred Wilson, Mike Moritz, Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz, Keith Raboy. What do I mean by like founders? Informal, pragmatic, genuinely interested in products and not just in money. Fair enough. I mean, that's a tweet, right? That's his own little tweet. Lisa noticed that it was not very diverse. And I was at home, I was like watching like, you know, the pre-Grammy, whatever, you know, what, I was, had my string cheese and I was chilling. And I just see a tag and it said, hey, that's an impressive list. Also, I mean, it was really innocent the way she said it. She's like, also, maybe you can hang out with like Arlen sometimes because then you'll, you'll like, you know, broaden your horizons a little bit. Your list could expand beyond yeah. some admittedly impressive men, she right. said. Totally legit. And so... His response, before I even saw that, like his response was, or, so now there's an or, because there's only room for one. He said, or I could just go next door or into the next room because my wife is in there and she's an investor. Jessica, and she's an investor. And I know what he was thinking, I'm sure, that he thought, you know, whatever. And so <laughs> I took a, I took a screenshot of that and I said, this is the problem. That first of all, there's an or, you know, and that that his his response to this is, no, I'm good. I got my wife here. She checks all those marks. Forget this. It wasn't that I wanted to be on his list. Um, I don't need to be on Paul Graham's list. It wasn't that I was trying myself to be on the list. It was just a really interesting way that he responded to Lisa. So then he responded to that. <laughs> which he has never, and I don't think ever in the five years that I've known about him, uh, or plus, I don't think he's ever acknowledged my existence. He responded, she's not just my wife. Um, she is an investor in her own right, and, and, and tweets like yours devalue her, something to that effect. And you're talking to a person who spends every waking moment of their life trying to better myself and to bring others with me who are underrepresented. And you've just called me sexist hmm. in front of people, like sometimes, you know, out loud. So that is when it all hell broke loose because my people <laughs> were like, uh-uh, no. Not today, not on my watch. <laughs> and, um, and then it became this thing. And I actually, you know, I got about seven or 800 new followers in about 16 hours, but I also had to block 
70 to 80 people yeah. because I was called racist. I was called an asshole by more than one person. I was called um, really bad, na you know, racist names, misogynistic names, um, all sorts of lovely things. And these are, the thing is like, I'd have no problem getting into it with Paul or anyone else. Mm -hmm. I think we know that. But you can't just have like an, a, like I can't just, a, dis, just disagree with you. Well, now and at this point, you're, it's not just Paul, you're the Paul's fans, Paul's people. It's like Paul's people, his people <laughs> are going for the jugular and, and he, he's able to be kind of insulated from this. And um, he doesn't, I don't think, I don't know, because I don't know him that well, but I, I don't think he realizes what he just did to my life this weekend. So what, have, yeah, tell us about the fallout. You, you, you tweeted, I haven't had to block this many men telling me how stupid I am since October 2016, when I had Peter Thiel's fanboys telling me how stupid and fat I am. She really doesn't mince words. Yeah, um, it's, it takes a toll on my m mental health. I'm very, I feel very strong. And I'm pretty honest, so like if I said online, like I'm okay, I did a video to let everybody know I was okay. I'm not lying, I'm not putting up a facade. But also, there's some, I have a lot of other stress and there's a lot on my shoulders and this was, um, it wasn't him, it wasn't the fact that he wasn't disagreeing, that's one person in life. It was the fact that, he, I, I don't wanna say too much because I think it emboldens others, but let's just say, he put me in, in, a, in a physical danger that is beyond just disagreeing with someone. You felt in physical danger? Oh yeah, yeah. But I, I don't wanna talk too much about it because then it just adds and adds and adds to it. So is there anything that you wanna say to Paul right now or, or Jessica who is a fabulous investor? I, I, I love Jessica, like Jessica's cool. I said it on a video, she's my homegirl. Like let's go, let's go kick it. Um, I don't know if I wanna say anything to Paul. I think, well. Or, or, or the people. I don't know, so, I mean, all these, all these guys in, in their underwear and basements, I just don't know if I have enough, I don't know if we all relate to them as well. But I would say, I would say Paul, like someone said online, it's okay to be wrong. I'm wrong all the time, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to ask questions, and you are rich beyond anyone's wildest dreams. You've, you've made it, you've already won, so, um, you know, take a day out and, and broaden your horizons a little bit. And I'm not gonna try to fix him or make him a better person, but please know that it's not, you, you have a lot of pull and you have a lot of power and your words carry weight. So when you get into it with someone, especially someone like me who I'm looking at my bank account every day just to make sure I'm okay still, like think about that for a second. You, you put my livelihood at risk by your flippancy and your complacency. So I would just say, maybe what you could do today is just tweet out, hey, Arlen and I disagree on something, but you don't, my followers don't have to be jerks to her. Mm -hmm. Leave her alone. That would be really cool. So, <clears throat> unfortunately what you're doing does represent in some ways, some people might perceive it as a threat to you know, the established ways of doing business here in yeah. Silicon Valley. So yeah. the title of this discussion is Breaking Rules While Breaking Ground. What's your advice to the people in the audience? What rules can they break while also breaking ground and not breaking everything? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't break everything. Uh, we need that, you know, that's why we ha can't have nice things. Don't break it all. <laughs> um, I just think that being being yourself and being authentic, and I say this a lot, but I, I just, I think that being yourself, being true to yourself, even through all of this, like I'm not putting up some, you know, fake, I could lose money here. I could lose money for other people. I could lose money for myself. But um, I, I think it's gonna work out because I'm being myself. So that is like your biggest asset is being yourself. It's also uh, your biggest fist in the air is being yourself because you have to live with yourself. And all this stuff is gonna come and go. Like there's gonna, in three years, there's gonna be something that everybody flocks to that's not venture capital. It's just gonna, it's gonna change like this. And so if you're sell, out there selling your soul for some VC money, um, 
you know, what have you done that for? So, you know, nothing's worth a check. Nothing is worth a check. Like, we're gonna be okay. I was sitting up there a couple of years, like three years ago, I was sitting up there. Couldn't hey, get a you seat. people in the balcony, hello. Yeah, I was sitting up there and I was, <laughs> I was watching uh, everyone talk and, and I, I, again, went in four years from not knowing when I was gonna eat next to being up here. And I've been the same person I was four years ago. And I, and I somehow ma managed to get this far. All right, uh, I'm gonna pull in Ellen. Okay. Can we take a picture? Oh, please. Can we memorialize the moment that you went from there to here? Yeah. All right, I want you all to be in this Ooh. picture. So everybody stand up. All right, Emily says or stand lean, up, so we do lean it. lean in, okay? We do it. Cop that Brotopia. It's just like the Oscars. Get that Brotopia book okay. if you haven't yet. <laughs> all right. Here, let's try to, okay. okay. All right, one, two, three, woo woo, okay. Thank you so much, Thank Arlen you. Hamilton, everyone.